I'm in CBS the other day, store uh, drugstore, and I'm there, and um, so I get up there and I go to check out, and the lady says, "Happy holidays." I said, "No, Merry Christmas." I said, "You don't take Christ out of Christmas," and the other lady was standing behind the counter. She says, "Amen, brother." I said, "Amen's right." I, she said, well, we have to do it because it offends people. I said, well, then tell them to go to hell. Some of you ain't got the guts to do that. But I want to tell you something. If you won't stand up for the truth, you'll fall for anything. And you need to realize that it's important that you don't give in to the devil and his tricks and his ways. Because there's many types of spirits out there to deceive the very elect. The Bible says God has to shorten the days for the very elect's sake. So if we're the elect, that means that the devil's out there to do what? To destroy us. That's exactly right. So anyway, I don't apologize for telling them to go to hell. Because you'd be surprised how many people is going to hell. It's made for somebody. And it's definitely made for people that don't believe he's the Son of God. And it's definitely for those that don't believe that they're going to change their lives and live for him instead of the devil. And we've give we've given the devil a lot of credit over the years. We blame the devil for doing this, doing that. A lot of it is our own fault because you know not to do it, yet you do it and then blame the devil. And you that are married, you blame your wife or husband. It's his fault. But anyway, <clears throat> um, Denville and I made a trip down to see my pastor, Reverend Jenkins. Or not Denville, I'm sorry. It was Daryl. I get them two mixed up. And we had a, a very short visit. It was only one day because I had walking pneumonia. It was about to drive me crazy, and I was coughing my head off. And But anyway, and I didn't want to give any anything passed on to Rev because he's had five different kinds of pneumonia. And the doctor said that it's a miracle that he's alive. And um, lately, and Rev said I could say this, so don't run out there saying I said it because Rev gave me permission to say this. Everybody say, God, God. He, gave he gave him the permission, the permission. to say what he wants Everybody about Rev. Y'all said that? All right. So don't run out of here and say that Bob said it. And it was God told him, he told me, and I'm telling you. That's the way it's going down. <clears throat> Rev is planning on, I don't know about the Florida crusade yet, but he's planning on going to Chicago and then coming to Ohio. And he wants to come to my church. And hopefully we can be out of here and be in a bigger building to let that happen because... Um, if he, if he does announce that he's going to be here, they'll be parked clear down to Pat Wasman's church, and everybody will be fighting to get through the door, and you won't worry about sitting in the back. You'll want to be down to the front. Hello, Walls. You won't come down here to see me, but you'll run down to see him. Just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, he's planning on doing that. And when I was down there, I got to personally pray for him twice and I got to hug him on his forehead and I could feel the hurt and pain in his life he's had so many people come and work for him that have stole from him they've come and they've used him because of what he is a man of God knowing that he can talk to God for them instead of them talking to God themselves and then turn around and up and leave and say all manner of evil against him. See, I've been fortunate enough to be around Rev, not as long as Rudy and a couple other people in the church, but I've been there 43 years. And I got to see the other side of the story. And the other side of the story revealed the true man. And Denville had a chance to do a favor for me, and it was also... God connected because he was going to Florida and he's going to be about 25 miles maybe from where Rev's house is. Pardon me? 34 miles from where he was going to be preaching, 34 miles from Rev's house. 
but he knew exactly where whereabouts Rev was because he's been around that area before. And um, when I was down there, I showed Rev some some stuff that I had collected that was left to me, um, a, a lamp that was worth four hundred and fifty dollars that was beautiful, it had angels on it and so forth. And and I found this, bought this thing. It, I don't know how to describe it. You'd have to see it. I can show you pictures of it. It's brass. It's turned green. And it has a wine bottle in it, empty. It was empty before I got it. And it has a lock on it, a huge lock. And it, my daughter had did research, and she found out that it was a private stash, it is what I guess you could call it, for a sea captain on one of the battleships. And they had to lock it down. Well, I bought it for three dollars because it was unique. It was different. Never seen anything like it before. I bought it for three dollars, and I showed it to Rev, and he said, "Oh, I like that." Well, Jack Cole liked that too. Both of them wanted it. So I turned around and I gave it to him. And Denville said that Rev said he don't Bob don't know the value of this thing. This is worth something. I said I don't care. I gave it anyway. But anyway, I gave him six Tiffany lamps. I gave him all kinds of antique stuff, statues. I, I gave him a marble eagle that weighed about 50 or 60 pounds, um, all kinds of stuff. And uh, Red says, you don't have to do that. I said, I don't have to do nothing. I said, have, Merry Christmas. And I boxed them, wrapped them all up, and I had some help back there. And um, we got them ready, and he happened to be going down there. But I went to, I was going to send the lamp because he really liked that lamp. And I went to the UPS place, and they wanted $300 to send just the lampshade and $300 to send the lamp. I said, geez, I can't afford that. I wanted to give him all the rest of the stuff. I had like, I don't know, 25 or 30 pieces of stuff I gave him. So I don't know whether Denver called me or I called him, but then it dawned on me he's going to Florida, and I called him back, and I said, Demo, I said, do you know where, uh, whatever that place is, Rev lives? What's the name of that place? Apopka. 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 <laughs> what do you think, dude? Anyway, so I, I I asked him. I said, would you want to do me a favor? He said, yeah. What do you need? I said, well, I said, I got all this stuff I need to take and send down to Rev, and I can't afford to send it, would you be willing to take it down? He said, sure. I said, well, let me call Rev and make sure it's okay, because you just don't send somebody to Rev's house without invitation. So I called Rev, and he said, sure. And I tried to tell Rev who he was. He said, I know who he is, because him and Rev was having a discussion over at the Howard Johnson about a blue jacket. And he wound up getting it through his head that Rev wanted that blue jacket and he took it off and gave it to Rev and Rev gave him a yellow jacket. So anyway, um, he took that down there and it, it, it played a very, very important part. And the reason I'm saying this is because all things work together for the good that's called according to the purpose, God's purpose. And here's what happened. Dimbo several years ago, puked up his vocal cords. He had no voice. He was to never talk, preach, or sing. But see, God has it all in control. And he was invited to go to a crusade, and he said, I can't go because I can't talk. God said, go. And when he walked out on the stage, God opened his vocal cords where he could sing and praise God and talk and preach. You say, well, what's that got to do with Rev? Well, Rev had surgery. They put him in an induced coma. And while he was in a coma from pneumonia, they went and cut his vocal cords without his permission. And they put a trach in there. Now, he can't, over the period of months now, he can't hardly talk. You've heard him when he's called in here. He struggles to, to bring out the sound. Well, this past few months ago, Rev ran into a doctor over in North Carolina that's the only one in the United States, might be the only one in the world, but at least the United States, 
that can do the type of surgery on that trach. And they went in and he scraped it and cleaned it out and put a big light and did all kinds of stuff. And Rev started talking better. Never had a bit of pain, a whole kit and caboodle, uh, everything. Rev is so excited about it. And the first thing he did is he called me to tell me to thank you all for your prayers. Well, what's happening now is he's going to go back and they're going to do another one. And hopefully this is the completion on it. And I think this is why he's wanting to go to Chicago and then he wants to come here because of our support of supporting him in the Crusades when he came to Ohio. And he wants to show his gratitude. But he also talked about dying. He's, and he started crying on the phone the other night and he said, Bob, I'm dying. I don't have long. I said, shut up, Rev. I said, you ain't going to die until God says you're going to die. And I said, you got a job to finish, and until you finish it, you're going to be here. He said, well, I just want you to know that when I do die, that I want Inkelbert Humperdinck to come to my funeral and sing How Great Thou Art. And it's very serious, because I don't know if you understand this, that every time God raises up a servant, whether it be a male or female, because there's in God's eyes, there's no difference. You might think there is, but there isn't. You might be looking at me as a male and looking at, at Ruth Ann as, a, as a, a female, but in God's eyes, there is none. You're a spirit. You're God's servant. And so therefore, all these years when God raises people up, like Billy Graham and Oral Roberts and Rex Hombard and all these different ministers, A.A. A. Allen and so forth, Jack Cole Sr. and so forth, these men are put on this planet and they are chosen for a purpose and a job and their job is to go forth and encourage people to let them know that there's reality in serving God. And in serving God, that means that you have to serve Him, not just go to church and act like you know Him because some of us in here don't really know God. But the thing about, about it is, is that Rev and Billy Graham is soon to leave. And their departure is going to be a sad day, but it's going to be a glorious day. It's going to be glorious because they made it home. They're with the Lord. And they have fulfilled their course. And they have done their job. What is so important is, is what they've done behind them. What encouragement, what type of an influence were they to other people? And these other people are able to carry on and pick up the cross and follow Christ. And that's what it's all about, is following Christ. I've made so many mistakes. And I've asked God, why in the world would you choose me to do this? He never gives me the answer. I can't get away from it. I want to quit, but I can't. I'm afraid to. Some of you don't understand that. See, you, could, you can get mad and go, and go out of this church and go home and have an attitude and and, and blame it on the preacher and blame it on somebody in the congregation. But I can't do that. And being a servant of God and being able to reach out and touch people's lives is very important. See, I'm not a babysitter. A lot of preachers babysit. People get mad at me because I won't come over and I won't talk to them after church. I don't want to talk. I'm talking now. What I got to say is what I got to say. I ain't got time to listen to your gossip, criticisms, and all this other stuff. Did you hear what so-and-so said? I don't care what so-and-so said. Do you see this? This is not a garbage can. Don't dump it here. Dump it in somebody else's. There's people that love gossip. That's why they have a gossip magazine. You can get on television every night, and they talk about all these movie stars, who they're, who they're, they're divorced and they're going over here and they're having a baby with this one. And this one here's got a baby with that one and didn't know he had a baby with that one. And people enjoy that junk. Yeah, that's what it is. And they blast it on Facebook. Now there is some things on Facebook that I can't say that I like, but, I, but it's nice to know when you see somebody that, I saw a, a little boy with no arms feeding himself with his foot out of a little bowl. And I thought to myself, my God, how precious is that little child that still has something that he can 
feed himself with his foot. And there's a man also that was put on Facebook many times and he doesn't have any arms and he walks and he's straight up and he sits in front of crowds and, and people sit there and cry because of of the confidence that he has in God. He doesn't blame God for being born deformed. See, we blame God if we get a toothache. We blame God if, if, if like, if something goes wrong at your job. <clears throat> you have to have an attitude, like he was saying about his job. Who was it? Mike was saying about his job. It ain't like they don't have other jobs. And if one goes down, God's got something better. If something goes wrong in your life, you don't take it for bad all the time. You can take it for a lesson to know on how to pursue for better things, to reach out for other things. And what we do is we lack wisdom. That's what we lack. And the Bible says if you ask for wisdom... You ask a hard thing because with wisdom comes heartaches and pain, comes with knowledge, the same thing, because you, you know more than just the natural. You know spiritual. You realize that there's something in your life that you need to add to it. Every one of us today needs to add more of God in it. We need to grow stronger in the Lord. We need to get deeper in the spiritual realm. We need to seek God's face. And as you seek God's face, you start understanding why the world is blinded to the truth. Not everybody is going to heaven. Not everybody in your family is going to heaven. When Adam and Eve had two ch children, two boys, Cain and Abel, one was evil and one was good. Go back and do a research and you'll find something there that you don't understand. There was an altar made and they were to bring an offering unto the Lord. And they did. One was accepted and one was rejected. The one that was rejected got angry. And that's what made him kill his brother. And he was told, if you, if you just turn around, turn your heart around and do good, everything's all right. But no, he didn't want to do that. He was jealous. And jealous is crueler than the grave. And when somebody says something bad about you or gets, you know, gets a, uh, some kind of gossip or lies or whatever going, that hurts. And it's hard to forgive people that do that. But at the same time, you have to understand that they're not spiritual enough. They want to destroy you. And it's all because they are jealous over you. I know people, <clears throat> and I know this through, through, through Reverend Jenkins, and when he says this, I always wondered it and I always questioned it. And he, somebody would say, well, what do you think about preacher so-and-so? And he said that he's a crook. Oh, geez, that's pretty bad. You don't even know him. He knows him by the Spirit. There's a difference. Well, hey, Rev, what do you think about uh, this preacher? He's a whoremonger. What do you think about this preacher? I wouldn't walk across the street scene. Well, he's got 35,000 people up in an auditorium, a stadium. I wouldn't give him the time of day. Now you say, well, why is that? Because when you have the Spirit, the true Spirit of God, you can read people. You can understand where they're coming from. How many times has somebody told you they loved you and turned turned against you? Huh? Anybody? Raise your hand. I want to know. Almost everybody in here. The ones that didn't, you're coming. Just keep keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. Yeah, it'll be there. If you have your Bibles, turn to James. First chapter. I'm going to start with the second verse. And this is hard to do. This is hard to do. But this is what's requested to do. 
And it makes you stronger if you can do what the Bible says instead of going by feelings or worrying about what somebody thinks of you or somebody says about you. It's very hard. But one thing you got to do is you got to obey God and trust Him. It says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you shall fall into divers of temptations. How many's ever been tempted? How many has ever yielded the temptation? So we're not, we're not perfect, but we need to understand why it's coming. It says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. Now, anybody in their right mind knows you don't pay, uh, pray for patience. Because when you pray for it, you're going to get a whole basket full of stuff. And none of it is good. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Meaning that patience, if you endure the patience and you overcome the, the temptation, that the perfectness is going to come out of it. Everything is going to come out in the wash, as I used to say. It says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask Bob. <laughs> you can ask me if you want to. I don't care. It says, ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and abrideth not, and it shall be given him. But here's the key. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. That means you believe that God hears you, number one. Number two, you believe that God's going to answer the prayer. And number three, you believe that you're going to get it. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And a lot of us, including myself, have done this. Not sure that this is truly what God wants, but we ask and hope. And we'll pray and not truly believe, but we're hoping that God will do it. If it be your will, God, uh, let, this, let this woman be my wife. Or let this husband. Or let me get this job. Or let me buy this house. Or let me get this car. And you're not sure that God wants you to have it. Everybody say amen. Because that is the truth. We always have our hand out for wanting. But we're not always believing that we're going to receive it. And when you receive it, you don't have to have faith for it no more. Understand that? Okay. For it goes on to say, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Double-minded means you're not truly, what's the word I want to say? Committed, grounded. Why it says that when you come before the Lord, come receiving, come believing that you're going to receive or don't even bother wasting your breath. Use it for your soup. A double-minded man. That's one that's not sure. That's like going buying a lotto ticket. You hope you're going to win, but you're not sure. So you turn around and you buy the ticket and you scratch it off and it ain't there and you said, that's what I thought. <laughs> and you pitch the ticket. But then again, you go there and you, you just, something within you says, I'm going to win this one. And sure enough, you do. So a double-minded person. That would be like, I'm going to go down here and I'm going to buy me a Corvette. And I want that red Corvette, that bright red one. That's what I want. And I get down there and that salesman talks me into buying a Volkswagen. It's red, but it's a Volkswagen. So I really wasn't steadfast on that Corvette. And who in the world would want a Volkswagen? But having a double-minded type thing in your, in your understanding is that when you read God's Word, it says one thing, but do you truly believe what it's saying? 
There's nowhere in the Bible that I have read that where it says, if it be thy will, heal me. Because it ain't there. It is his will. You have to know God's will in order to command ye me, saith the Lord, and get what God has promised you. He says, Beloved, we are the beloved. I wish, that's him, he's wishing, above all things, that you what? Prosper, be in health, even as the soul prospers. He's talking about the spiritual man. And that spiritual man is one that can read the spirit and understand it. Reading the word and understand that's God directly talking to you. When God says he's going to do a certain thing, do you sit there and argue about it? No, most of us go and ask somebody else's opinion. What do you think? Now you got two confused people. It goes on down to verse 12. Blessed is a man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he receives a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot tempt, be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. So when something comes on you, some kind of a, a disaster, an illness, and so forth, don't sit there and blame God because that wasn't his fault. We tell our kids, Santa Claus brought that. Instead of saying we celebrate Christmas for Christ came to earth to redeem us, in exchange we exchange presents in his behalf. And then people get on there and they make a mockery because the is Islams doesn't want you celebrating Christmas because Christ is in Christmas and it offends them. Ask me if I care. 